A while back, I did a video about motorizing shades. There's blinds, there's curtains, and there's shades. I've done them all, but the first one I did was shades, and it's time for version two. If you saw that video, you might remember that I have seven windows, and I want them all to have shades. Back then, I only had time to put the shades on one window. Since then, I've learned a lot about how to do motorized automated shades the right way. Not that I did it wrong, but I do know how to do it better now. That's enough yapping. Let me show you what I did. This little box right here is the heart and soul of my motorized shades. You're gonna recognize a lot of these parts. D1 Mini running ESP Home. We'll get to that sketch. The L928N motor controller. It actually controls two motors, which is what I'm gonna do because I've got six windows, three of them on top and three of them lower. So I'm gonna use one of these controllers to control the upper and the lower shade. So I've got three of these boxes. Each one controls two shade motors. Got it? Good. This is my wiring diagram. Let me just run through the connections. 12 volt positive goes to this terminal on the motor controller. Ground connects to a whole bunch of stuff. The ground pin on the D1 Mini, one terminal on both of the push buttons, and one terminal on each of the four end stop switches. So you're gonna have a lot of ground wires connected together. Plan accordingly. This terminal is where five volts comes out of the motor controller, and we can use that to power the D1 Mini. There have been times where I've had trouble powering a D1 Mini through this five volt pin. There's been other times when it worked. In this case, I've done three of these, powered them that way, and they're all working. Now let's look closer at the connections on the D1 Mini. There are four pins on the motor controller. These two control the motor on this side. These two control the motor on the other side. I'm using D1 and D2 for these two, and D5 and D6 for those two. Next, for the two push buttons, I'm using D3 and D4. For the end stop switches, I'm using RX and TX for two of them, and I'm using D7 and D0 for the other two. This little guy right here is the resistor that you need to put between D0 and 3.3 volts. And finally, these two terminals go to one motor, these two terminals go to the other motor. See, that wasn't so bad. And once you've got it all installed in the box, it looks like this. This is my test setup. So I've got everything wired up just like it will be when I install it. And I wanna make sure it's all working before I install it because installing these is, is a pain, causes me to get up on a ladder. Something that might look a little funny. What you see here is a resistor that's going between the three volt pin right here and D zero. So I did that because for all of these end stop switches, I needed to use the internal pull up so they wouldn't be floating, you know, floating. I tried using the internal pull up on D zero and it just didn't work. Maybe there's not an internal pull up you can use on D zero, I don't know. I also couldn't use D eight because D eight has a pull down resistor connected to it. So I figured putting an external pull up resistor on D zero would work and so far it seems to. And I tried a lot of different methods. I didn't wanna to have to run a ton of wires to do this, but ultimately the most reliable method for making sure that they stop when I want them to stop was to use these. These have the very long flapper. They don't have to be exactly in the right place because sometimes when the shade comes down, it's in different spots. And so this long flapper makes that so that it'll catch it no matter where it is almost. One more thing before I tuck all this in here, I like to use hot glue to make sure that none of these jumpers pop off when I'm stuffing them back in the box. It's also nice for keeping things insulated so you don't accidentally get something bumping into a ground wire or, or any other kind of short circuit situation. Did I miss anything? I think that's everything. 
So now we're going to test it out. It's all powered up and I've been poking around with it and it should work. So here we go. We're going to push the button. That's spinning that motor. I don't know which one of these is which, but when I touch the end stops, it stops. Great. So I tested this end stop. And I'm going to put that one off to the side. We're going to push the button again. And I'm going to test the other end stop. Great. So I know those two work. I'm going to try the other motor and the other two end stop wires. That one works. Push it again. It's going the other direction. Test the other end stop. Beautiful. Beautiful. Now let's run through the sketch. Let me show you what is going on on the ESP home side of this. Did someone say what's ESP home? Glad you asked. ESP Home is a fancy little bit of software that lets non-programmers like me use inexpensive little boards like this to create our own custom smart home devices. And best of all, it interacts directly with Home Assistant. What's Home Assistant, you say? Only the world's best smart home hub. If only there was a way to share links to videos about ESP Home and Home Assistant. Where would I put them if I wanted to share links like that? Mmm. Ow. I want to quickly go through the ESP Home sketch. Top part, basic stuff. Logger, baud rate zero because I'm using RX and TX as in-stop switches. Next, we define four GPIO pins as outputs, and then we assign one switch to each of those GPIO pins. Now for the binary sensors. There are four binary sensors that function as end stop switches and two that function as push buttons. This is what you need for an end stop switch. Define the pin number you're going to use on the D1 Mini, set the mode to input pull up, inverted true, give it a name, give it an ID, not that you're going to use it, but it's good practice. And most importantly, on press will turn off two of the switches. That's what's going to stop the motor when this end stop switch is pressed. So I repeat this three more times. What changes is the pin number that I'm using, the name, the ID, and which switches get turned off. The next two binary sensors are the push buttons that will be the manual control. So if somebody's sitting next to the window and just wants to open the shade or close a the shade, they push the button and it makes that happen. I've used this same layout now three or four times. If the shade's going up and you push the button, it stops. You push the button again, it goes down. If it's going down and you push the button, it stops. If you push the button again, it goes up. Works great. The cover entry is what gives me my up and down arrows to let me control the shades. When you define a cover, you set an open action, a close action, and a stop action. For the open and close action, I left the delay in here. I don't really need the delay anymore because I have the end stop switches, but it functions as a nice backup just in case the end stops don't do their job. That's the end of the quick version. If enough people want to see the extended explanation, let me know and I'm happy to share it with you. But I've watched myself explain YAML files and it is boring. So I thought you'd appreciate a shorter version. You're welcome. These are the parts that are going to go on the rod. This is a 10 RPM geared DC motor. It's on the smaller side, but it's definitely strong enough to lift these curtains. I've tried a couple different speeds of these. The highest I would go if you're going to use this small motor is 45. I tried 45 RPMs and it was adequate. It was slower going up than coming down, so I think that's probably pushing the limit. But with these 10 RPM motors, I have had no problem lifting the curtains. They're not that heavy. This is a 3D printed little box. Once I solder my connections here and run my wire out that hole down here, I slide this motor in here. Shaft pops through that side and it fits in there real nice. I can then mount it up against the wall and there it'll go. On the shaft, I've got this guy, again, 3D printed part. It's made to slide right on there and then this is made to fit on the inside of a one inch Schedule 40 PVC pipe. And it fits nice and tight, but I'm also gonna put a screw through the pipe 
and this so that they hold together real well. So that's one end of the rod. The rod is the PVC. And on the other end, I've got one of these skateboard bearings. Uh, these were bearings I already had. These are the 608, and they're not quite big enough to fit inside of a one inch Schedule 40 PVC. So I made this little 3D adapter so that the bearing could sit inside of this, and then this will kind of sit in the end of the PVC. It's got a little tapered end here. You just kind of pop that in there. It fits fine. If you wanted to glue it a little bit, you could, but it fits fine like that. And then this part will screw to the wall and the other end of the PVC will just slide on there and that'll spin. Piece of cake, right? So those are all the parts minus the PVC that goes in between them. And you'll see that when I actually put it up on the wall. That's all that I can do sitting here at my desk. The rest has to happen on a ladder. So I'm five out of six windows I have the shades installed. I'm gonna do the last one and I'll walk through a little bit how I do it. I've learned a lot about how to make a shade, uh, do it yourself style. The material that I'm using is really good blackout material that is really inexpensive at Hobby Lobby, which is an American thing. I don't know if they have many place else, but it's only like, uh, I think it was less than $7 a yard, $6 maybe even a yard. Let's get the close up on how you do this. All right, I know the lighting is gonna be screwy on this because it's bright and then I'm gonna hang up a curtain and it's gonna get dark, but just bear with me. This is the blackout material. Soda loop in it, my wonderful sister, Sister Z's. This is the three quarter inch PVC. It goes in this loop and that will be at the bottom and that's what will keep it going straight when it goes up and down. Now I already have hanging up here, I don't know if you can even see it, but we'll zoom in. This is the one inch PVC with the motor over here and the bearing side over here. Without any tape or anything on it, I roll it up over this. All right, so now you pull it way up so that you get this part through. And then you wanna kinda eyeball right to left and make sure that it's hanging fairly straight. I've found that walls are not to be trusted. They're not square, they're not level. Um, so you can't go based on being lined up with the sides or the top. You have to base it just on how does it hang. And what I've been using to judge is uh, just how much light it, there is, the gap for the window there. This I left really long because the problem I had before is I didn't have enough uh, material. You know, it got to the bottom and it was all unrolled and it looks bad. I think that actually looks pretty straight, but I can't tape it here. I gotta tape it up here. So I'm gonna let this down. I'm gonna put the piece of tape here. And then I'm gonna let this down over the edge like that, and then I'm gonna get my lovely assistant to tell me if it's straight. What do you say, lovely assistant? What do you think? Does it need to go right or left? I think it needs to go to the right, but I don't wanna to go too far to the right. Then I stick down the tape on one side, grab a, another piece for the other side. You need a lovely assistant to make this really work right. So how are we looking? We still looking pretty square? Okay, I'm gonna back up and take a look at it too. That's yeah, good enough. Now we keep on taping. Okay, that's it. I still have to install sensors and I think my 3D printed sensor holders are probably close to done. So we'll do that next. So this is my 3D printed extension to help make sure that we hit the end stop like this. Without that, sometimes the PVC would just skirt by. But with it, we get a good stop every time. And then we've got the same thing at the bottom. This is the Cat5 cable. 
that I used for all these sensors. It just goes from here all the way up and every time I need a pair I just pull a pair out uh, and connect it to the switch. This extension was pretty important at the bottom too because you can see how it moves sometimes just based on wind and things. <laughs> it actually even misses it a little bit in this one. Took a long time to perfect it, but now I think I got it. Doing quick math in my head to try and figure out about what each window cost. Motors about $12, end stop switches a dollar, 3D printed parts a dollar, PVC maybe $2, uh, two yards plus a little on the material, even if you say $7 a yard, 15 maybe for that. So grand total less than 40. For automated shades like that, that's pretty amazing. So you can control them all together, or you can control them individually, and of course, you can also automate them. I've got them set right now so that when the sun gets a certain number of degrees above the horizon, they close, and when it gets to a different level above the horizon, they open. I don't think I can make it any better. That's all for now. As always, thanks for watching. Till next time, adios. Because uh, it's, I love it, love it. Someday my house will be clean and quiet and I will cry. Someday yes, someday my house will be clean and quiet and I will cry. If you need help or want to chat with me or others who also enjoy projects like this, you can find us on Facebook and Discord. If you like what I'm doing and you want to support me, you can use my special product links in the video description or head over to Patreon or just like and share my videos. That's easy. If you like this video and you want to see more like it, this box will take you to a playlist of some of my favorites. In addition to videos like this, I also do live streams every Sunday. This box will take you to a recording of the latest live stream. That's all for now. Adios.